Hi everybody, my name is Scott Hillier, Independent Film Director and President of ECU, the European Independent Film Festival. Thanks very much for joining us here on our um, usual Friday live um, discussion where we, um, we bring together a myriad of people um, to talk about great subjects that um, you know, we think interest our independent filmmaking community and hopefully uh, an audience at large. Uh, today's topic is films of protest. And we all know that films can change the way people interact with the world by providing visually stimulating and thought provoking experiences toward to audiences. From the anti war movement to the current climate crisis, film has been used to criticize and deconstruct current and past events, encouraging waves of discussion. In the realm of fiction, we have films like Full Metal Jacket and Don't Look Up, and in nonfiction, the films Night and Fog and uh, Sea Spiracy. Wow, that's a good one, Dory. All powerful films grappling with the events that surround them. Um, we, um, but what impact do, do these films truly have? Can films be a power for change? Do people really care? Well, we're going to discuss that on Eku Friday Live today with um, two guests. Um, and I'm going to start one. One is um, Matt Camp, who works for Greenpeace, and the other one is Yuri Alves who's a very, very talented filmmaker, and a, we're honoured to have him as an EQ alumni. Um, I'm going to come to you first, Yuri. Why don't you um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me. It's wonderful to see, uh, see you, Scott. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, my, so uh, I uh, went on to this uh, crazy journey of being a filmmaker. And uh, I started uh, quite young. Uh, I was, I think, about 12 years old when I started doing my first short film. And um, I, I guess it's kind of uh, shaped my entire life. Um, the pursuit of, uh, of, of, of having the need to, to tell stories and to um, want to express things that are meaningful uh, to me and my collaborators. And um, yeah, I, I, I can't really think of a time uh, where I wasn't working on something and um, it sort of almost as if uh, filmmaking and just existing in life uh, sort of, you know, sort of um, was a marriage um, that kind of never, never really, uh, it was a relationship that, that was formed and never was undone. Um, whatever the uh, sacrifice or the uh, um, cost of it, uh, um, it's something that I guess I'm, I'm, I'm in it for life, uh, for, for, the, for the good and for the bad. And, um, and yeah, and so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I've had some, some wonderful, uh, 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 you know, small victories along the way of, uh, of, of, of inspiration and encouragement. Um, um, obviously, I've, I've said this before, but, you know, Eku had embraced uh, uh, my films throughout the years, and, and that's meant the world to me. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, so I, it's, it's like, I, I have so many things that I can say in terms of what, my journey has been, but all, all, all I think I'll just leave it that uh, 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 when something is meaningful um, for whatever reason, um, it's when you find that in life, I, I guess it's something that, that goes a little bit beyond you. And, um, and so, um, so yeah, so cinema has kind of been uh, the great obsession of, uh, of my life and continues to, to be. <laughs> We're going to um, play a little clip from Broken Clouds, which played it on um, Ecu in 2011. And you're, you're, and I, I've always said this to you and to the people in the audiences, like when we watch a Yuri film, we we feel safe and warm in the hands of a great storyteller. So um, let's have a quick look at Broken Clouds. We breathe in oxygen, and once it passes through our bodies, we exhale poison. All the, the human evolution, all it's really been is one long, drawn-out suicide. My goodness, I got goose, goosebumps free watching that, Yuri. Um, fa fabulous, fabulous, fabulous work. Um, I'm going to move on to, to our other guest. Uh, it's Matt Kemp. 
Um, how you doing, man? Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you get up to in life. Hi, uh, Scott. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to be here with Eku and especially in this time when we're seeing film festivals start to happen in, in real life again. It's really exciting. Um, so my name is Matt Kemp. I'm uh, a, a filmmaker by training and by education. Um, and after graduating film school in 2008, I was uh, for some years a freelance cameraman editor working across uh, documentary and fiction feature shorts, commercials, um, and so on. And um, around 2010, I started doing some kind of small freelance jobs for Greenpeace International as an editor and a cameraman. And eventually that led to me joining um, Greenpeace International in Amsterdam in 2012 as a permanent video producer, where I've now been for a scary eight years. So um, across the Greenpeace network, we of course um, have, have offices in uh, 30 countries and a lot of different kinds of productions. So my role within Greenpeace International is to um, support uh, produce and uh, commission for the global campaigns across oceans, forests, climate, and so on, and also also support our uh, regional offices in the production of, of their uh, uh, film content or uh, video content. So yeah, that's that's my background. Okay, I'm just going to um, ask Lauria here to just play a little clip that we've got of Greenpeace, just to everybody knows about it. But let's um, let's see a few images from that. Well, there you go. There's just a little sort of reminder there of um, what Greenpeace does and, and does very well through the use of media and, and imagery and stuff like that. But um, now I'm going to speak to a master of imagery and, and um, creating emotional responses. Yuri, you know, I've watched all of your films and we've, we've had them here and we've seen the audience reactions. And I'm just sort of thinking, you know, if, if we were to stick to the theme today about um, films of protest, you know, are they effective? And is there any is there any sort of one something that's actually inspired you in your filmmaking career? Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe they 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 are effective. Um, uh, I, I know for me, as as an audience member, uh, there's movies that have done that to me. Um, so I, I need to believe that that happens. I I, I have a few of um, over the years, but one that stands out to me um, was uh, I, the Exit Road. That short. Um, uh, I remember we we screened it uh, was in LA and um, uh, I, I, I guess it was, it was a, a recovering addict was um, it's a film that that deals with uh, you're in a, a day in a life with a, a, um, an ex convict who's doing everything he can to stay away from going back into um, into in, in, into in, into the the world of, of smoking crack and this you know sort of like an allegory uh, tale 
And uh, when we streamed it at this, at this festival, I remember um, um, uh, one of the audience member, um, he was a recovering addict and, and he was crying, you know, and he came up to me and hugged me in the, in the days where you can hug people without, without fear. Although I'll hug anybody without fear these days still, I, I, I don't care, I don't care. Uh, but, um, and, uh, and, I, and I remember him uh, just looking into my eyes and just saying that, oh man, the portrayal of, uh, because, uh, because with, with the film, what I tried to do with the film was by the end showing that his, when he eventually falls back into, into that, that that is almost his freedom. And so it was a little bit of a sort of complex, controversial element of instead of condemning the drug intake, to, to him it was actually his freedom because that's where he felt at home, you know. And that and ha it, it being presented in that way, um, I, I guess had affected him. And so he, you know, it was just a wonderful moment of just feeling as if well, we had arrived at some kind of some kind of truth within this. Um, obviously a very expressionistic sort of um, uh, approach to, to the film, you know. We're just gonna play a little bit of it as we as we keep talking. I mean, this was a, um, again, a very, very powerful film showing really bad things, you know, in a way protesting about, you know, how bad this crack is. It's yeah. very, very, very powerful imagery again. Yeah, and, and it was also, uh, you know, uh, and I, I used actual uh, people that actually were in, in, inside of that world and um, um, and it was almost the idea of how you're 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 cast out into the fringes when you're a part of that. And so, how how can somebody take you? How can how can society embrace you again? You know, and uh, and for the, in in the film, it's as if he has no way to be embraced uh, by anyone. Um, so, yeah. okay, um, so you know, they, these films of protest, we'll call them, and and sort of just. I mean, I, I call it more, you know, opening up, taking the blinds off people and actually showing them um, important things that people should know. Um, Matt, obviously films and footage and stuff plays a huge part in Greenpeace's outreach to people. Is there a way that you can quantify that and, and to sort of say this does work? Because there have been many successes, right? Yeah, I mean, many successes. I think uh, our, our history is, is completely intertwined with, uh, with images, really. Like the, one of the first Greenpeace um, expeditions against whaling in the 70s was sort of defined by this moment. Um, Bob Hunter, one of our founding members, uh, coined the term a mind bomb, which I suppose now would mean going viral, really. But there's this very shaky... 60, millim 60 millimeter footage uh, shot from an inflatable boat in the North Atlantic and uh, a, a whaling vessel, a big uh, Russian whaling vessel firing a harpoon over the top of these environmental activists into a whale, like just a few feet over their heads. And once that um, film reel got back to land and was distributed to the news media, it just exploded. And the, you know everyone across the world all of a sudden, almost overnight, knew who Greenpeace was, knew what was happening in these very hidden, remote areas of the world, was aware of the, the whaling campaign. And it really, I would say, launched our organization almost, right? So from the very beginning, I think, like, the, the power of images and the power... It's interesting what you said, actually, about, you know, calling it... These are protest films and, and interesting in relation to um, the film of Yuri you just showed, because it's... Pro Protest films is kind of suggest this sense of um, you're making a film against uh, something or, or you have a clear opponent. But I think perhaps a better term would be, um, as you said, these kind of taking the blinds off and allowing people to connect and empathize with situations that they would never have an opportunity to experience in their own lives, possibly. And then I think through that connection, through that empathy, through that understanding, that's what really raises awareness, changes people's minds, you know, inspires people to take action. And really that's what has the effect um, that we're trying to see in the world. So, I mean, although you could say Yuri's film perhaps is not a protest film as such, I think it does exactly the same thing that Greenpeace films are doing, which is simply giving a, a, a representation of, of a situation that needs attention but that people wouldn't have the opportunity to experience otherwise. 
Yeah, I, I, Matt, I would, I, I, I would say that I, I definitely agree with with the way in which uh, uh, that the way in which you, you've expressed that. And um, I was going to say, you know, before it, it makes me think a little bit, especially because of how the state of the world uh, right now. It's, uh, you know, what what are the images that we can believe or not believe these days? You know, and 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 cinema being this sort of vehicle for empathy, it also has the power for misinformation for obviously the greatest propaganda <laughs> uh, to ever, uh, art form ever, in terms of being able to uh, uh, influence you. So there is a, a sort of this uh, um, responsibility, I think, to, to images um, and, and, and obviously um, everything that you guys stand for is to shed light. And, and of course, like you said, you know, I've always been interested in, in stories that go into the, the, the macro of, 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 of something, because I think that that's also from a dramatic standpoint, I could, I can go in and then I can explore the small thing and turn it into something epic, you know, even if it's intimate. And uh, I've always been, been drawn to, to the, those types of stories. Um, but I, I guess I wish that there was a way um, for us to, um, mm, you know, because yes, uh, uh, cinema and and um, uh, and uh, and commercials and things of that nature, they are there to spread and express a type of truth. And I wish that I just seen. I mean, ever since uh, Scott, I mean, from 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 when we first met, how different the world is today. You know how mm -hmm. how absolutely insanely different it is. And uh, and I guess not to be pessimistic, <laughs> but I sometimes wonder of. Um, uh, are people believing the images or uh, because you know like and, and how, do, how do we go back to the purity of, of of what's what's on there because even a documentary with all of the digital advancements and all that it's like what what you people are literally picking their own truth so it's as if you're tuning into the channel that either um uh reinforces your already distorted um truth or perhaps can enlighten you, but I think it's getting harder to do that because I think people are are doubtful of the things that they're seeing, and I wish that I wish that they weren't taking away the the great force and weapon of images. But I feels like they're 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 it's dissipating somehow, you know. I I could not agree more. I think the the the, the disintegration of 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 trust, I think is is basically what you're getting at is um. Yeah. You know the trust element, and and again, you know, we can reinforce our own views, but we don't look onto other people's views. And and it's a shame for me as a documentarian to actually go through that. And it's very very difficult. I, but I, I'm going to pose a question, and you you brought us back to today, and also um, a slightly pessimistic view. But I am, you know, we're here in Europe right now, and we're living through this Ukraine business. And I I spent ten years as a war cameraman. I I thought I was going to go and save the world, and it got blown up by Russian bombers in Chechnya and was, you know, had very tricky circumstances in Mogadishu and yeah. Syria and Baghdad and all these places. And I honestly thought that I was going to save the world with that. And I got very uh, disenchanted by that because I felt that nobody was getting, would, nobody cared. Another starving, dying baby, another Bosnians killed. But I have to say in the last month, I've seen a dramatic re-engagement, I think, with the, with the people around me and people I'm speaking to with, the, with U Ukraine. And um, I, was, I sort of feel like grabbing them and saying, yeah, well, I, I was in Chechnya in, in, in um, 20, you know, 1994, and the same thing was happening, but nobody cared. There seems to be more, more engagement. Is it, and, you know, I'm gonna, I'll talk to you, Matt, about that. You know, you're, you're sort of on the front line of this type of stuff. But, you know, is there more engagement in, in, in Greenpeace and what Greenpeace are doing? Or is, you know, because I, I honestly, I felt for the last 20 years, people just didn't give a shit. You know, if, if it was on, if it wasn't on Facebook, it didn't matter, it didn't care and whatever. But is there, a, am I just sort of sensing this or is there more of engagement happening? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think, as you say, that these types of images, um, you know, the, the children in famine or children in war or these, these types of images almost became so overused and so relied upon that people just became fatigued with it and kind of closed off to it. I mean, it's a terrifying thing to say that how could you see images like that and not feel immediately the need to do something, you know, but I think that was the, the reality of it. And I think in a, in a sense, it has kind of, um, perhaps we've become somehow a bit more sophisticated now, like, 
we, we, we know that we can't simply rely on those, in a sense, quite stereotyped or cliched images to elicit a response anymore. It has to be a much more um, meaningful, in-depth, kind of intersectional, and much more sort of focused on uh, storytelling, I think, in, in, in the broader sense of not simply conveying information and expecting that to be enough to change people's minds. Because as, as you said, and as Yuri said, you know, people these days, that the facts are subjective all of a sudden. So information has really lost its currencies. In a, in, I mean, it's again, a very scary thing to say, but I do feel that's true. So it's, I see a swing towards um, real storytelling, you know, in, driving emotion um, with fact to, or information to support it rather than expecting that the information itself is gonna do the job. So that's why I think like people like Yuri and, and other filmmakers are, are getting more and more power to be able to influence narratives through society, to be able to change people's minds and really have that impact. Because um, as people just start to move away from sort of news, they, they are drawn more towards uh, emotional sources of information. And that's where I think film plays a really important role. And I, and I think also just becoming a, a trusted source. I think I, I push this on the ECU crew all the time. You know, I'm like, I got a comment there the other day said, oh, I've just read this on Instagram. I'm like, well, if it's not on the BBC for me, I'm just not going to listen. They say, oh, no, no, but this person has 60,000 followers. I mean, that's not a trusted source to me. That could be 60,000 idiots as well. And unfortunately <laughs> for me, the, the young lady was exactly right because it did happen. It was broken, but it was... I was saying to her, you know, I'm, sometimes I don't let people upstairs into the office unless they can tell me what the top three news stories are of the day um, because, you know, engagement and, and stuff like that. But I think you're right. And, and Yuri, you know, as a, as a storyteller, what I'm, you know, is there any sort of technique or anything that you do? And again, I'm, we're talking to an independent filmmaking community, and I love what you're talking about getting the macro of this. But is that is that what we should be concentrating more on, sort of deep? emotional macro looks at subjects? I, I, for me, it, it seems like um, the human aspect of the intimate for me has always been a, a better starting point than the, from, from the outside. Because from the outside, um, uh, I, it feels a little bit impersonal or almost sens sensationalistic because you can just like ah, ah but if you if you if you be it's almost as if uh i don't want to I, I hate to use this word uh, manipulation but we know as filmmakers you know they're, they're, that is one of the weapons that we use for the good for the good and i think that if um it, because even with like edge road for example which is just a film i'm using as an example it's how can like what i what i want to do is how could i make an audience identify with something that they really don't think they have anything in common with. But I'm here to tell you and demystify this and try to and make you see that, you know, you're not, you're not so unlike this person. And that, that, uh, the aspect I think of, you know, it's like, it's like the old thing of, you know, uh, it's like that, you know, we're all alienated. We all feel alienated and we all have that. And we only have, we all have this denial of death. And we walk around and we have this, these illusions and the things that are meaningful are just a way for us to essentially deny our own mortality, which maybe is why I make films. I don't know. Deep down inside, it boils down to that. But if you can bring something and in a way, it, it, you know, I think of like a film like Goodfellas, you know, which is a very sort of commercial film and, and all that, but so much honesty in that movie. And, and what does that movie do and achieve in a way that a lot of other films don't? It makes you have a really good time at first. So what it does is he lures you in, he seduces you. And I think that maybe nowadays, at least for me, I always think like, okay, if I'm gonna make a film and all of the hardships of trying to make a film, I, I, I always think, I want to try to put something up on that screen that will resonate. It's not about it being good or bad. It's like, how can I make something unforgettable? And it's with contradiction, tr contrast, and it's with, uh, and it's with seduction. It's to seduce them. Because if I seduce you, then maybe I can bring you to a truth and allow you to enter into a place. But if I try to, at the, at the very beginning, tell you this movie 
is important because it's about this. It's like, maybe I'm going to turn you off. So I always try to have those two things present, which is storytelling and entertaining you in the sense that I can lure you in. And then be, without you even realizing it, there's that other little bit that, you know, to me feels like, okay, this is, uh, you know, in my mind, at least, this is my contribution, you know, and this is the thing that maybe, um, you know, uh, drove me there because, you know, Scott, you know, like the things that like actually bring us to a project are the smallest little things. It's like, it's the one thing. It's like, it's the look that he has when he sees that person. And the entire thing was only about that for you. And if you had told that to somebody, nobody would have gotten behind you. Cause they're like, hey, what? <laughs> yeah, they're like, what the, the look you want to make the movie? Cause the guy looks, it's like, yeah, but and I think that, um, but I think that it's those little small moments, like the gaze of somebody, or even like, I always love very much, you know, when you watch a movie and you're basically, you've created something in a way where you can almost in your mind, it's as if you're watching somebody like the human face and you can see them. And all it is, is what you think they're thinking about. And I feel like, is there really anything greater than that? Because it's what we all do when we're interacting with each other. We're using words, but even that is a manipulation. It's like, how do I truly know you? Like that little voice inside you. And I think that we all yearn for that, that transparency. And it's like almost like a, like I'm trying to, I'm, Scott, I'm talking about trying to make it in a way where somebody can have a sort of transcending of some kind. Because I think that, that that's what I think evokes like true movements. It's like, how can you do that? And uh, there really is no clear answer, but I think that um, over the years and seeing like how images are, are being used and um, how evil they can be. I mean, let's not forget like what, like, you know, what Hitler did and all, I mean, you know, some of the greatest movies ever made, by the way, I mean, incredible productions, but I mean, it's like all of this was like devised. So again, it's like, I think that it's something that comes with a, a very heavy responsibility and um, and I think that it's 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 like you can't forget at least in, at least to me I'm like I can't forget that although these things to me are important I don't want to isolate the audience I want to bring them in but then once they're in I want to allow them to understand that yeah, we're all confused and we all feel this and uh, and we're all and no matter wealthy poor black white everybody is on the ticking time. And that's the human experience is that, right? It's like we have just a little bit of time on this earth and it's like, and that is sacred. And so what are yeah. we doing with that time? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you're telling great stories and entertaining the world. Um, <laughs> Matt, just, just very quickly, well, not very quickly, but um, what, um, how do you at Greenpeace keep the impact happening after all these years? How can you still create that impact? Because, you know, things have changed. Absolutely. Um, for, for, for Greenpeace, I think it's always this um, delicate balance because, you know, Yuri made this great point that if you start off saying this film is important, you have to watch it, like immediately no one is interested. So I think the way that we try to uh, stay, stay relevant and stay impactful and, and, and keep these messages, especially messages that are, are difficult or kind of depressing, quite frankly, to, to convey, but important, is to do exactly what Yuri was just discussing really, which is to find the universal in these situations and to bring things closer to people's, to what people recognize from themselves, right? And I think maybe this goes back to also your, your point about getting the sense that people are feeling more engaged these days. And I think, you know, that, that sense of distance has shrunk. So when you see uh, wars or famine or um, ecological breakdown, I think even a few years ago, it was very much the sense of like, oh, that's happening over there. This is way out of my sphere, my experience. I mean, I'm, I'm talking from a very Western, you know, uh, global North perspective here, so please forgive me for that. But in general, that's where our audiences were. And I, I get the sense now that um, through these kinds of, um, tools and devices such as Yuri uh, was talking about, like going, fi finding yourself in unfamiliar territory, but drawing out those very human, very universal experiences that everyone can recognize, um, I think is the key to 
to creating those connections, that empathy, that impact. I mean, people now, they, they, they realize that if there's, um, you know, if the Antarctic uh, is, it melts, that's a problem for everybody. Like these things are no longer as far away as they were a few years ago. They're, they're, they're creeping up. People start to recognize it on their own doorstep. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good point. The, the distance is closing. And, and um, yeah, the, the idea that we lull ourselves into the, um, the idea that we won't die at some stage, Yuri, of course, is, is also a good thing. Um, let's, um, let's move on again, you know, we're independent from making community behind us. What, what advice, you know, and, and we're not here to sermonize or anything, but, you know, what, what advice can we, can we offer filmmakers, you know, apart from trust, empathy, entertainment, Yuri, what, what should they do in the, in the idea of, you know, bringing home these truths in a, in a cinematic way? I mean, I, 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 at least to me, you know, having grown up in Newark, I always was surrounded with such characters, you know, a very blue collar sort of neighborhood. So there was a lot of, lot of sorrow, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of sort of immigrant experience, you know. So I was always surrounded by, uh, you know, just in incredibly human stories um, that were both uh, sort of what, what Matt was saying. It was like a very singular, but felt very universal as well. And so I think that filmmakers, I mean, especially from a, a sort of from the documentary uh, uh, format, I mean, maybe you just, you have an amazing story that's just right there. I mean, um, obviously with, with limited funds and budgets with independent films, I think that this sort of, which is sort of the, the world that I've kind of been in a little bit, this sort of quasi narrative fiction documentary, sort of marriage of those two worlds. But, you know, you could do just a more uh, straight up documentary approach and, uh, and, and there's nothing, everybody's got an amazing story that's walking on this planet, everybody. If you really peel back, everyone's got a story worth telling. So I would say that um, maybe that's a great place to train and to uh, uh, sharpen your instincts is to just find a subject and through that subject uh, unravel uh, what the story is and, and try to um, you know, bring people in and identify with somebody that maybe they wouldn't uh, likely um, think that they had anything in common with something like that, perhaps. You know? Yeah, I think that's a that's great advice. And you know, you're very prolific, and I think that you know, I'm, I'm in awe of how prolific you are in making films because I know that they're not easy to do. But I think that's that's great advice. You know, just find a story and jump on it. Um, Matt, how do you know? How does this sort of what advice or what what sort of guidance could you give to young indie filmmakers in the in this? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think first things first, you know, just do it. You know, don't wait for the perfect scripts or for that, that funding uh, thing to come through or for this to happen or that to happen. The, the technology is so available now and, and you know, just go out there and shoot. I think what, what maybe I would say just further than that is, um, like, I would really encourage young filmmakers to be very mindful and very conscious of uh, who is telling the story uh, in their in their film in their piece, and how are the protagonists or the antagonists or the characters? How are they being placed within the narrative of the film, be it documentary or fiction, um, in a way which uh, kind of empowers them in a way you know I, sorry i'm not making this very very clear but i think it is something that for example for greenpeace it's been a, a journey you know this 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 kind of classic uh, image of i don't know like 1950s bbc of this white man standing in front of a tribe explaining what the tribe is doing and this this shift this very conscious shift towards letting people tell their own stories and then even further than that, like examining your role as being someone there with a camera, with a sound person, uh, the editor, whatever, like be very conscious and mindful of what your role is in the story and whether it's an, an active participation or um, you're letting someone else kind of guide the story. Uh, I think being very conscious of that as a filmmaker is, is really important as well. Yeah, you, you, essentially like the, the point of view you're saying, right, Matt? Like the, 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 the point of view of it, yeah, yeah. No, I agree, I agree 100% uh, uh, with, uh, with, with that. Um, I, I was also gonna say, you know, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, we all have a sort of malevolence inside of us to some degree, 
that we sort of through, you know, religion and society or, you know, uh, how we're raised, we try to battle them away and understand what's right and what's wrong. But, you know, sometimes I think like, for example, I can't understand in my mind right now, I'm sorry to talk about the war, I'm sorry, but I can't understand in 2022 that there can be in such an advanced place, such savagery over something as banal in the end as, as land, <laughs> you know, it's like, has, hasn't he heard of the metaverse? We're not gonna, we're not gonna need land anymore, but, but, right. but, 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 but not to make a joke of it, um, I, I guess I, I always feel that it's like, yes, this man is evil, but there is a part of me that it's like, I would like to understand why and like, I would like to understand, like, I, I think that sometimes also to get to the root of real change, instead of exploring things in a, uh, from uh, uh, perhaps a judgmental place in some ways, it's like, I would like to understand um, how does evil like that exist? Um, what's behind it? Um, to try to deconstruct it, because to me, um, I would like to understand, you know, I would like to understand, you know, how, how, and, and even going, going back to uh, Matt's point, you know, how, you know, there's obviously this, uh, the entire world is connected, yet somebody lives in the reality and they're like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's on the other side of the continent. This doesn't affect me. And, and it's like, you know, this idea that everybody is separated, but then we're not separated and everybody sees that and they feel that in their pockets, for example, in the, the, in the, in the West, uh, you know, in the US, the gas prices. So it's like, so, so it does affect you after all. So, so what you said isn't true. And so it's, it's how can exploring, you know, what's behind all of that corruption you know, but not in a way that just points to fingers in a way that is, what are the things that can be done to truly stop this, you know? And, um, and I just wish that, um, I wish that, you know, that there can be a film or a series of films that could actually get to the root of that. Um, because to me, uh, it's a lot easy. It's very easy, right? For me to just kind of look at everything that's happening and say, oh, he just, oh, well, he's just crazy. And then we just move on with, and it's like, yeah, but he's there. But he's alive. He's a, he he exists, and and you know, and you know, and what 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 is going to be the consequence of uh, that um, unexplored evil that we've just kind of shut out, you know, and put in a closet and just said, yeah, yeah, he's one of the bad guys. But you know, like but no, what I, is think, that? I think yeah, I think the point is that you know, obviously, it's one of the reasons we're talking about this subject today, but. You know, I'm also hoping that people are out there making films about this so we can understand why. Right. And I like your point about the judgmental because it is, you know, I've just been in Australia, which is as far as away from Ukraine as you want. And then it's like, oh, the guy's just crazy. And then they walk away. Well, you know, I've been, I spent a lot of my life over in that part of the world. There's much more to it than that. You know, they, these people play chess. Um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot happening. And um, so I, I also cannot wait for the, the films of protest, let's put it that way, of just... Mm -hmm helping me understand why I've got my point of view, but I'd like to be challenged and I'd like some facts and whatever behind it. So, you know, any aspiring filmmaker out there, please, you know, just pick up that ball and, and go running with it because, you know, it's, you know, trying to help us understand that. But um, just, you know, I'm, I'm very, very um, aware of the fact that, you know, we're taking up a lot of your time here. I just wanted to open up the, um, the floor to some people who may or may not have questions to the um to you guys so are there any questions here Ludovic I'll let you run this bit yes I have a question um so uh, of course we've talked a lot about uh, uh, making uh, films uh for protests or documentary type of films or um denouncing evils in the world through you know, a film that it's engaging and entertaining entertaining and when uh, while Yuri was talking about uh, Goodfellas I was also thinking about Do the Right Thing by uh, Spike Lee which um, denounces uh, police brutality in the black community and which is still relevant today even though I believe it was made 1988 or 89. Um, how and maybe this is a question also for Matt Greenpeace how do we make sure that 
uh, the entertaining we pulled people in we made it we made us understand the message and the, and they were like ah oh, um, it's it's messed up that it is going on something should do something about it how do we turn it into a call to action and we make sure they do not live as just having watched some entertainment that made a, made them think, but we quantify that into action being put in motion, I guess. Um, I, I can speak on that real quick, Matt, that's okay. Uh, uh, well, you know, you use the perfect example, uh, with do the right thing. Uh, you know, the film diffuses you with humor, you know, because without the humor, you wouldn't be able to, uh, it's that whole thing, right? He uses the humor, and this very sort of colorful character. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, that film, by the way. And, uh, and he uses those characters uh, to, to diffuse the seriousness. And then he builds up to, to that really tragic ending. Um, and uh, how can people, I mean, that's the problem. You know, I, I, wish, I, wish, I wish I had an answer to say that I like to believe that yes, films have an immense impact on culture on people's mindset. I mean, that is very clear. I don't think that that's like that. I think that that's a fact, you know? Um, you know, there's, there's nothing, you there really can't say that that isn't true. Now, I think it's a matter of how do you make people care? You know, that's the problem with humanity in some ways. You know, we are um, very uh, distracted. You know, it's like you, you can rally people up and you can get them really heated for a little while. And then suddenly, um, you know, uh, they're gonna go watch the soccer game and they're gonna go do this. And it's like, so how do you keep that? At the same time, in keeping this momentum going of some kind of explosive sort of rage against um, um, injustice, at the same time, um, causes a lot of mental problems in society. So it's like a double-edged sword because it's like, what's the, what's the balance, right? Because I have friends of mine even now that are like, oh, I can't watch the news anymore. I, I don't even watch the news anymore. I can't, I can't take it. And it's like, and they're almost like, well, I need to spare myself of that sufferment and there's nothing I can do about it. So let me just live my life and, uh, and try to enjoy the small things and, uh, and whatever. And so, uh, so it's, it's really tough, you know, it's really tough. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I believe that um, when people have truly had enough you know, that they will rise up um, and those moments have happened. Um, but, uh, but I think that uh, it's a lot to ask, especially from, um, you know, people that have a, a lot of comfort in their day to day. And uh, it's always that thing, right? I mean, it's all just such an amount of luck. If you're born in one place versus another, you have a completely different life, free will, Destiny, I don't know. I think it's just some people were born here, other people were born there, you know? And, and unless the entire world, you know, um, can truly unite, um, there will never be a way for there to be any like real, um, let's just call it fairness in terms mm -hmm. of how it's distributed, you know? So it is to the people that have that comfort and that have that possibility and those opportunities to try to help the, those that don't, you know? But it's like, are they motivated enough to do that? Um, you know? Yeah, anyway, sorry guys, I've been blabbering. I'm, I've been going on and on, you know? I, I, I wish I had a better answer for, for, for that, you know? No, maybe but, always, but you know what? Always do the right thing. So I <laughs> <laughs> nice, Matt. <laughs> I think it's, it's a really interesting question. And it's an interesting question at Greenpeace because of course, in a sense, having this, this call to action um, is a very easy way to uh, measure the metrics of impact, right? So, you know, how many people signed a petition, how many people watched your video, how many people shared it and so on. But for me, that's quite a superficial measure of real impact and engagement, I would say. And I, I, I would personally, um, and it's not a view shared uh, across the whole organization, but for me as a filmmaker, you know, I think what's what's perhaps more important is to um, feel that through your work, through your your the, the work you're producing, you're very consciously uh, challenging societal narratives and uh, sort of dominant stories 
that really do define um, us, the, the world we live in, right? Be it, be it through uh, levels of inequality or uh, institutional racism or sexism and these things. And, you know, by being very conscious of who, whose story you're telling, who, whose voice are you raising, who's, uh, who are you centering in your film and whose narrative are you kind of trying to replace the existing narrative with, um, being very deliberate about that and very conscious about that, I think has massive impact, although much more difficult to measure in, in a short term. But in terms of changing language, changing uh, what's considered acceptable you know, in society, just kind of moving that baseline towards in a direction that we want to see the world going, I think is, is really uh, the power that, that filmmakers, storytellers, artists, musicians, people working in the cultural sector really can contribute. So yeah, it's just a question of trying to convince the people who really like to see, you know, this many likes uh, as a measurement. That's that's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm. Um, I think we're going to start wrapping these things up quite quickly. Um, I do want to just talk a little bit. I always try and throw f further forward. Yuri, what are you what are you working on at the moment, man? What are you going to stun us with in cinema soon? <laughs> Stop flattering me so much, Scott. Too much pressure, <laughs> too much pressure. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm working on a few things. Uh, you know, the last couple of years, I've just been, I've been really just writing a lot, you know, and trying to get um, a, a proper feature, quote unquote, um, off the ground. And um, I'm close to that. So uh, let's, let's wish to the gods that uh, such things uh, will actually come about. And, uh, and also in the meantime, I'm working on an actual documentary. I'm very excited to show you so a documentary, something I shot almost 10 years ago about um, some friends who came together and uh, formed a band. And through that, it, I sort of explore um, uh, their backgrounds and they're all immigrants and uh, all of them in the US and it explores sort of sociologically, uh, the sort of the sins of, uh, sins of our fathers kind of thing, right? It's like, I'm trying to, you know, the, the band becomes just a new family that they inhabit. And so it's not, it's really like a film that is about the band making it, but it's really about them being able to transcend the things that have kept their families behind and all of sort of the, uh, you know, the haunting, um, pain that follows them and then through the music is where they're able to um all come together and have a singular voice and so uh so the film is really about uh it's really about that you know it's about fathers and sons and uh, an immigrant community and of course the american dream in that in that regard and also just uh, the, the hardships of uh, sticking with um wanting to uh, be an artist and uh, i know a lot about that very that was a very personal part of it for me i know how hard it is to um stick with it and um and so it also explores a little bit that, you know, the battle of, uh, of, of staying, staying true and uh, through financial, uh, you know, uh, problems and, uh, and relationships that kind of go, go, go about that fade away, um, sort of that drive. And uh, so, yes, and the, the movie is it's called Paint the Rust. And, uh, but it's a full feature, so it's gonna be an hour and a half and, uh, and I'm, I'm excited, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it right now as we speak. I was actually just editing it before, so I should probably have it done in the next uh, three months or so. So it's been a long journey. Well, yeah. that's, that's what well, I'm yeah. well, you know where we are. So, um, <laughs> Matt, just talk to us about, you know, future projects for, for Greenpeace and, and also, you know, you know, use this use this platform, however small or large it is to, um, to try and get people to come along and, you know, do and act yes yes absolutely we we need all the filmmakers and artists in the world to um, to contribute to this we've got an epic battle i think talking about projects it's sort of a strange time because m most of the campaigning the, most of the projects i was working on up until a few weeks ago are now of course on hold and so it's this sort of interesting time i, I hope i'm not going to sound opportunistic when i say this but you know, the, the war in Ukraine has really uh, opened up conversations which a few weeks ago would never have happened, you know, like in terms of completely reducing uh, European reliance on Russian oil and gas, which is a huge export for them and a huge source of uh, carbon dioxide. So for Greenpeace, it's kind of the, these huge moments. It was similar with COVID, uh, these, these very disruptive 
sort of uh, historical moments in society do offer a window to be able to present a, a, a view of the world or a, an alternative future um, and in a way which people are more receptive to. So actually in these periods of a very kind of uh, extreme tumult and, and disruption, you know, there are opportunities for very for smart campaigning and to really change the systems which have led us uh, to so many problems in the past. So, you know, I mean, like I said, I don't want to sound opportunistic, of course, it's a horrible thing. And we're very much, uh, you know, uh, in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and innocent victims. But there are opportunities now to start looking, you know, about the future we want, basically. So. Yeah. Well, I, um, yeah. Go, go for it. Uh, I would just, just ask you something. Um, and what would you say would be at the very top of the list of the, the, the one thing that everyone can do to start helping with everything that Dreampoint represents? Like, what is the, like, what would be the call to action that somebody can, that somebody can do, you know? Like, do you, you know, like, yeah, man. I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? I wish I could right. say, I, th I think to be really honest, and this is interesting when it comes to narratives and stuff, like if I use um, the example of the, the our plastics campaign, what we've seen is uh, companies like Coca-Cola and Nestle and these huge producers of plastic, which is supported, of course, by, by the oil industry, really pushing this narrative about if you recycle if um you know you can you can change this problem and the, it's it's a complete smoke and mirrors it's a mirage what the reality is it has to these changes have to happen in a societal systemic uh institutional level like we i think having this sense of something that we could of course there are things we can do we could drive less we can fly less we can eat less meat we can you know be mindful of our environment and and working in the, in our work in our lives to 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 improve it but the real change has to come from governments and corporations so and i think this sense of is on us to fix this actually that's that's one of these narratives that we need to really be fighting against i think so in, in the end, it's, it, it boils down to uh, the governments themselves need to actually, that change really only occurs there, like on a, in the big way, in the big way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to, go to give the impression that like we can't do anything in that case. I mean, we can vote for the people, we can hold them accountable, we can make demands, um, you know, in countries where that, that can happen. Mm -hmm. So we hold, we hold a lot of power as people, but in terms of those um, real societal changes that not only address the environmental crisis, but you know, structural inequality, structural racism, these intersectional issues that are feeding into each other, um, you know, that, that needs to be addressed on a societal level. So um, yeah, that's what we should be. I am um, well. I mean, talking talking to you now, Matt. Of course, is um is very inspiring because you know I and I'll be having an offline chat um, with you afterwards about see how I can actually offer my help up because you know I've been around for a long time and maybe there's some way that I can actually help and I would like to think that we're going to have the same impact with the people we're speaking to. I'm going to wrap this up, guys, because I promised you an hour. We're gonna we're gonna leave shortly. Um, my very but clever can I stuff. Just, always yeah, one more thing, oh, yeah. just just quickly. Yeah. I mean, you're you're saying like, what what can we do? I would say like, the filmmakers make films, music makers make music, artists create. Like everything that you do, which affects or touches or inspires five people or ten people or ten thousand people, that's where that's where you can really contribute. So you know, I, I think it's it's a great thing you, you do, and and thank you for very much for for arranging this conversation. It's really nice to talk to you. Oh, that's that's fabulous! It's, it's all this flattery, you this. But I think you know, as as we as we wrap up on this, um, the a couple of takeaways I got from me was, you know, cinema is a vehicle for empathy, and you know, to make people care, which is what I'm the question, the open ended question here that I'll leave at the end of today is to address to filmmakers and address to myself and the, and the staff is, how do we make people care more? And, you know, I think that's, you know, and, and I, I will always go back to trust, trust and honesty. I think that's that's what we, we need to do. And we do need to be beacons of trust. And, um, you know, I know Yuri is because, you know, it's, it's I see the, 
I see the soul in his films. So, you know, any aspiring filmmakers, be truthful, honest, and, you know, show the soul. And, and you know, to your point as well, Matt, you know, pick the narrative structure of where you're going to go and what the story is and, and replacing the narrative that's there is, is always great advice. And, and also everybody has a story. You're, you're, dead, you're dead right, you know. So filmmakers, pick up a camera and tell that story, whether it's your grandmother or your next door neighbour or it's the kid out there riding skateboards down the street annoying the hell out of you. Everybody does have a story. And the only thing that's stopping us now with this, the idea that we can pick up cameras now and, um, and make proper high-quality films is great. So... Um, I'd like to thank Yuri, Matt. What a, what a great conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to speaking to you, Matt, offline, just about you know, what we can contribute um, to, to Greenpeace as filmmakers. Yuri, keep on, keep on keeping on, man. You, um, you excited yeah. me just talking about your documentary. I, I know it's going to be great. So, um, can I just, say, I just want to say one, one more thing just to add to what Matt said. Matt, it was wonderful to uh, speak with you. And uh, I, I, obviously, um, uh, from my side, um, um, I, I admire very much um, what you're doing and the cause of that. And I just wanted to add to what you were saying that um, I think one of the things that also might be important is um, uh, to forgive the people who have done such wrong and to forgive ourselves as well. Um, because I think that that is important for a change to happen, because I think that if we can find a way to also understand the true power of forgiveness, I think that we can also have a moment where we can have an enlightenment because, you know, we all look back and we all think of some things that we've done that we're not so proud of and others have that in different scale. And I think that it's like, uh, it's, it's too late for me. Oh, it'll, you know, that kind of idea that it's, oh, it's already, oh yeah, yeah, maybe in another lifetime. And I think that like, so I don't know, maybe uh, films that deal with uh, um, the power of forgiveness and how the, um, you know, I think that, that also helps change things, you know, because if we look into the past, I mean, it's pretty terrible. We've, as a, as a, as a species have done some really terrible things, but mm -hmm. we can forgive ourselves for those things or else we'll never be free of them, you know what I mean? And that, and carry them with us. You know? Anyway, that's it. Okay, I'm done. That's, it. <laughs> That's a nice point to leave us with, Yuri. Um, okay, guys, thank you. Um, thanks to the EQ crew who helped put this together. And um, we'll, um, we'll see each other back on, um, on next Friday. And by the way, you know, the uh, tickets will be going on sale shortly. European Independent Film Festival, Paris, 8th, 9th, and 10th of April. Of course, you two guys are, are invited at any stage. But um, please come along and join us. And we, we promise you a, a great independent film experience. Mm -hmm.